Let's talk about the flip side of this, or, or maybe the, the deepest and darkest part of friendship, which is when a friend fails us. And we've all had that experience of betrayal, a friend that drifts into error, or a friend that drifts into sin. Uh, maybe you could help the pastors here process what was a common experience for the Apostle Paul, for the Lord Jesus, uh, when friends fail you. When that happens, how do you continue to pour yourself into the lives of people? Uh, how do you ensure that you don't become self-protective, but you continue to mm. invest and pour in and love mm. your friends, uh, even when friends fail? Mm. Talk mm. a little bit about that experience in ministry, mm. Pastor John MacArthur. Well, um, I guess for me, it goes back to our Lord and Judas, or it goes back to Paul and the Demas, um, the best of the best of the best of the best are going to be betrayed. And the more you invest in someone, the more potential they have to devastate you. So you can be gun shy. Um, my dad told me <clears throat> when I was just starting out in ministry, something that you referred to a minute ago, don't make close friends with the people you serve with because you'll find yourself being so terribly disappointed. I usually took my dad's advice. I never took that advice Be because it was overpowered for me by the experience of Christ, and not just with Judas, but even with Peter. If he was disappointed with Judas, who was a devil, how much more disappointed was he with Peter, who was a true believer? So who am I to expect loyalty from everybody all the time? And we, we know what Paul endured, whether it was John Mark or Demas or whatever, and who knows all the other stories, all in Asia have forsaken me. How can you come to the end of your ministry and say, everybody has forsaken me? How is that even possible? And you're the Apostle Paul, and you're the reason that anybody is even a Christian. But you, you have to understand that that goes with the territory. Um, that's part of it. And you, you can't, I mean, you do some inventory on in your own heart. Could I have done something different? But for me, the Lord has always balanced that with many more who are faithful over the long haul. And I, I focus on that and rest in the fact that if it was true of the, of the Apostle Paul and of our Lord, I should probably expect a whole lot more disloyalty than I get. You know, there's an interesting connection uh, that I didn't see until about three years ago in, in the Demas text. Um, in verse 7, I think it's, uh, I've fought the good fight, I've, I've finished the course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, and not only to me, but to all who have uh, loved, loved his appearing. And two verses later, Demas disappeared in love for the world. And so I think one answer to the question of how you survive Demas is by loving the second coming, which generalized means something like this. This world is one conveyor belt of disappointments. I mean, every day has a disappointment in it. Some situation didn't go the way you want. Somebody lets you down. Life is disappointment. And some of them are awful. Demas probably broke his heart. But he so loved Christ, and he so loved the second coming, and he knew that everything's going to be worked out. It's all going to be okay. So I think having a heavenly mindset, which is the way Jesus told us to deal with slander in Matthew 5, right? When they say all kinds of evil against you falsely, rejoice and be glad. Why? Great is your reward in heaven. So how do you even function in the midst of slander unless you love heaven, unless you believe in, in the future, the world to come? So that's, that's one piece. And, and another piece I'd say about bet betrayal is um, don't become embittered. Lean into reconciliation possibilities. It might seem absolutely impossible that this relationship could be fixed. It's just not going to happen. It's just so ugly. Don't believe that. 
God does miracles. So the worst betrayal I ever experienced was 1993. Seven-year adultery. Man I'd worked with for 10 years. Devastated the church. 230 people left in those days. I think we had about an attendance of 1,200 in those days. 230 people walk because they didn't like church discipline. And I had dinner with that man 10 years later, and we wept, and we held each other, and I attended his funeral, and I hugged his wife, and we made it okay. It was okay. We're going to be in heaven together, and that's possible, guys. It's really possible. And your job is to believe that and not to be the one who's just sneering and saying, you just get out of my life and you stay out of my life because what you wrecked in this church or what you wrecked in my relationships. So believe the miracle is possible that reconciliation could happen. You know, building on that, um, building on that, I think you also have to look at that person as an instrument through which the Lord is perfecting you. That's right. Um, th- those, are the, those are the best times for your spiritual benefit. Um, they, they tear down your pride and self-confidence and sense of privilege and expected rights. Um, and if you will look at the person that hurt you the most as the instrument that God used, then you'll understand what Paul was talking about when he wrote to the Corinthians about the thorn in the flesh. And the Lord said, I'm not going to remove it because when you're the weakest, you're the strongest. And I think we're ne- we never are going to be We're never going to be too weak to be effective. All right. That Second Corinthians reality of chapter 12 really runs through that whole book, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, may the, may the, that pastoral suffering is for the sake of their people. It's just all through the book. It just starts off in chapter 1. May you be comforted with the comfort with which you have been comforted by God. So if you wonder why you're going through the hell you're going through right now, it's for the sake of your people. God wants to do something in your shepherd heart that will make you a more wise, compassionate, loving, insightful, caring shepherd. 